here playing with my <laughs> predictor minimal service theory, which I'm going to talk about. Uh, I also want to thank uh, Mike Anderson. He seemed to have done a lot of work, uh, at least for me, trying to get me to get here correctly. I want to thank him also. Uh, okay, so I'm going to be talking about classical theory of normal surfaces. Uh, it's always hard, hard for me to figure out what I'm going to talk about. Um, I'll at least mention some things I'd actually worked on this year and uh, some things I've worked on the last probably couple of years. Um, and also maybe some applications of other people's work. Um, so first let me just start with the definition of what a minimal surface is. Uh, I imagine most people know about it, or at least one of these full on definitions. Uh, zero mean curvature, uh, least area locally, uh, soap films, that'd be like least energy locally, um, or least energy samples. Uh, harmonic functions, and neuromorphic Gauss map. And uh, depending upon what uh, one is trying to accomplish uh, theoretically or in producing examples, one kind of chooses one of these definitions as sort of a convenient sort of frame, frame to work in. So, uh, uh, for example, if one's studying conformal structure, uh, one might, for example, emphasize uh, definition number four. Harmonic functions are very closely related to uh, to conformal structure, and uh, you'll kind of see that in my talk. I'll be kind of emphasizing different different parts of this the equivalent uh, formulation of minimal surfaces. I mean, essentially, I'll only be talking about minimal surfaces in R3. Uh, I'll mention a couple of related results that just give insight into the examples that uh, examples in theory in R3. R, R3. Uh, but the emphasis will be R3. So let me just try, try to draw a picture of what we mean by the Gauss map. Um, so we have a, a minimal disk in three space. It's parameterized conformally by a disk in the plane. When you do that, the conformal, the coordinate functions are uh, harmonic functions. And one has the Gauss map, uh, the unit normal map, the two-sphere stereographic projection. And it turns out that combination ends up mapping the disk into the extended complex plane. That's a conformal map. So in that sense, it's, it's uh, a meromorphic function. It's a local representation. Global Riemann surface, and uh, the uh, Gauss map would be a meromorphic function of that Riemann surface. So, uh, let me just try to give you an indication of what things I'm going to try to touch on. Um, these are kind of, sort of general, general things that people look at in the subject. So the first one is uh, I, I, I would always sort of recall just as hard as one of my first interests in the subject was to try to understand what are topological obstructions. In other words, if you're given a surface, uh, will it appear as a properly embedded minimal surface in R3? And uh, for many years, there were essentially no obstructions. Obviously, it can't be orientable, it can't be compact, but except for that, those possibilities, we really didn't know much at all. And uh, part of the goal in trying to understand number one is really to understand geometry. Uh, it's very hard to do anything about number one unless you, you know properties like asymptotic behavior. Uh, lots of interesting properties about the surface, uh, geometric properties. So in order to attack number one, we have to understand the geometry. And uh, in particular, the asymptotic behavior. So uh, so this is the behavior as the surface goes to infinity. Uh, what, what is it? Uh, does it converge to something? Uh, various properties. So we'll kind of see that in the talk. So asymptotic behavior. Uh, conformal type, uh, for example, here, uh, I'll just give an example of, of a conjecture related to conformal type. And parts of my talk, I'll be able to prove this conjecture in certain cases which are important. Uh, conformal type, for example, properly embedded minimal surface, take a positive harmonic function on it, it's constant. That's conjecture. So that's the property of the conformal structure. Somehow properly embedded in, it, in space restricts the conformal structure. And that, that infinity can be fairly large, but, it, but it's very controlled. Okay, so, um, and it, it actually can be very small when it restricts topology, for example. So, so we're going to be looking at uh, the, the property of uh, conformal type. A uh, classification really is classification. What are all the examples of some type? Uh, I, 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 there's some pictures over there. I'm going to talk about them again in a minute. For example, what are the simply connected properly embedded minimal surfaces in R3? The uh, claim is we know what they are. So I'll be talking about that. And part of the classification actually yields topological obstructions. So I say, what are all the examples of the good type? There aren't any. 
then I, I, I know that I've got a self of obstruction. So even, even number one can sometimes be thought of as number four. Number five is really a three-dimensional manifold uh, sort of point of view. Uh, this, this is, a, I guess it was uh, motivated initially by a result that uh, Blaine Lawson had. He showed that minimal surfaces in the three-sphere were unknotted. If you take any two of them, same topology, then they're, they're, they're ambiently isotopic in the three-sphere, or the homeomorphism taking one of the other one. Uh, now, I'd like to try to present uh, sort of the final res result of us, this sort of situation of unknotted in three space. So this is a project which actually started my thesis under Blaine uh, when I was looking at triple periodic minimal surface that had some generalizations of his technique and sort of three sphere. And uh, as the years have gone by, we're getting closer and closer to understanding how minimal surfaces are embedded topologically in three space. So that's a sort of a topological curve topological question, but obviously it has to do with minimal surface. So we're saying something about minimal surface. Okay, so that's what I hope to accomplish. Uh, so let me just first start with some standard examples. We have the catenoid. Turns out, uh, turns out what? <laughs> it's the only annular example. So that's part of the class we could all be talking about that. Why is the catenoid the only annular example? Properly that in our experience. We have uh, the helicoid again, simply connected. Plane and helicoid are the only simply connected examples. I'll be talking a little bit about that. Uh, here's uh, one of my, actually, my recent problem I've been thinking about for a number of years. Um, it's known that if you take two minimal surfaces, by like work of Kapileus, they intersect, uh, intersect uh, transversely along some contest that occurs, you can perturb the surface a little bit and get rid of the intersection by what's called minimal surgery. So you think of sort of this, this picture is, take two planes in R3, for example, orthogonal planes, if they intersect along a line, then it, then it turns out you could desingerize that intersection by doing little, kind of think of it as bent paper, and just have little handles going across. Okay? And the claim is that, uh, well, Kapileus sort of used this surface to desingerize intersecting minimal surfaces. And the claim is this surface is unique in some natural sense, and which it showed, which, knowing that, would show that uh, the, the Kapileus construction is the only way to desingerize two minimal surfaces. So when you approximate two minimal surfaces intersecting by an embedded minimal surface, then when you blow up, like where the curvature is blowing up in the limit, what you see is the surface. And as the angle changes, it's, actually this is flexible, there's, a, there's one parameter family of, uh, of Schurz examples, all periodic. So that's a sample found, very interesting sample found. Thank you. Uh, this is, well, this is a periodic surface. So um, so you just keep on translating it vertically up. Yeah, it's asymptotic to two planes away from the z-axis. So as you go away from the x-ray axis, it's asymptotic to uh, two planes. There's a conjugate surface of that example. In other words, you locally parameterize that by a disk to conjugate functions. It turns out the conjugate surface is doubly periodic. And you've probably seen this picture on picture of like uh, mathematics books or calculus books or somewhere. This, 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 exam, this example is a sort of fundamental region for this double periodic surface. It's a graph over a rhombus. In this case, the rhombus looks like a square. But it's a graph over a rhombus, uh, and it glues onto the, 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 the vertical lines over the corners of the rhombus. Okay, so this has got some four straight lines on it, sort of an infinite graph. I've got the picture. So asymptotic to vertical annuli, vertical strips. Uh, <laughs> anyway, uh, if you take that example, you can extend it by rotating around the straight line boundaries. One gets a periodic surface. If one wants to understand that kind of surface, one usually goes to the quotient, quotient surface. If you just took that, for example, that fundamental domain and just identify diagonally, it was loud, <laughs> identify diagonally, one would get a projective plane minus two points in R2 minus Z. Z2. Okay, so. As you write, my have those two translation vectors, the group generated by in, in the question space, I see a projected plane. It's more usual to think of it as uh, a slightly bigger lattice, and you usually, usually consider it to be a two-sphere with four ends. And 
T2 cross R the quotient space. And you can do it lots of different other ways, take other sub lattices, and you can get other surfaces in T2 cross R. Important point to note here, for example, I can get a two sphere minus four points, I can get a two sphere minus six points. You can get lots of uh, lots of these examples, which are planar domains in C2 cross R, and so hopefully I'll be able to indicate why the only genus zero examples in C2 cross R are in fact shirk examples. So that's again a classification there. So if you forget what these surfaces are, they kind of draw little pictures over there. So hopefully I'll be able to talk about that as well. This picture is more, is, uh, it's an interesting story behind this picture, but uh, this picture is supposed to demonstrate an example of a surface. Uh, this is a compact part of a complete surface in space, and it has three annular ends. This is more, I'm thinking along the asymptotic behavior of a surface. So this, as you go to infinity, it's interesting near the origin, but as they go to infinity, it's sort of not very interesting. It's asymptotic to, it ends are asymptotic to catalytic fixed of different logarithmic rows. It's not just one catenoid. You can take a catenoid and almost like a shrink it. So there's sort of a, like this catenoid end down here is, is, is uh, reasonable. This is probably just very flat. This one's a little bit less than the bottom one. Anyway, one has these ends of the surface and they're asymptotic to particular surfaces that are well known for catenoids. You can also, if you, surface example a little bit differently, you could have the middle end be asymptotic to a flat plane. Okay, so that's more to demonstrate the asymptotic behavior. And here's my probably my favorite kind of problem in the classical theory. It's trying to understand uh, this is related to other problems about minimal surfaces and three minimal. So I can emphasize that there are these problems that make one interested in and uh, very general theoretical questions that make one interested in this, uh, this example. Uh, so let me try to explain it. Uh, take a, you could take a stable catenoid and just shift the circle sideways. Then it has an amazing property that that new soap film is still foliated by round circles and horizontal planes. So that's surface of revolution, but it still has this sort of nice level set property. And uh, what happens is uh, the, that's the analytic property being circles, and the surface analytic boundary can be extended a little bit more. Anyway, if you, if you kind of let, let it extend itself naturally, eventually the radius in finite time, the radius of the circles go to infinity, and you get straight lines. Straight lines in the circle, infinite radius. So once you get this sort of basic picture, you can flip flop it, rotate around those, those lines, and again, just continue the surface. And when it's not hard to see, one gets a periodic surface. So Raymond uh, discovered these examples and wrote them down in terms of uh, functions on a torus, a quotient torus. You know, um, I was just interested in that bigger picture. So remember the previous picture, that was sort of like a fundamental domain for a bigger surface that's periodic. So that's what this is supposed to indicate. So this is, uh, so in other words, when I think of bigger, bigger fundamental domains, I can see a better visualize the surface better. What does this surface approximately look like? It looks like a stack of planes at integer heights, and I join up the planes by tubes that go off in a diagonal. So there's sort of a, a diagonal here, and I sort of join the planes up. There's a drain under a diagonal upward translation. So if I translate up that way, uh, then the surface is appearing. Now, at every level, I essentially see a circle or a real line that's a line that's just a circle, the point removed. So it's not hard to see that the surface is nothing more than an infinite cylinder, topologically, where I remove points, one point at each integer height on the cylinder. And I can even, I can even one, if I pick the right radius of the cylinder, I can actually conformally just map this into space. So I can actually parameterize it conformally by the cylinder. So it's the circles in the cylinder go to uh, circles in three space, or a line in three space. So it's not too hard. So I just want to view this a little different topologically. Think of a cylinder as you got sort of one top point infinity on the cylinder, one bottom point, so when you kind of compactify it, you have the Riemann sphere. And what I see in the Riemann sphere are uh, the surface topologically as I move the north and south pole, that's sort of a plus infinity, minus infinity, and I have all these points, which are or the ends of the surface, and the 
they, they have limit points which are the north and south poles. So topologically, it's a two-sphere. I've removed a countable number of points with two limit points. So that's a formal picture for me. Uh, notice it, it's not hard to think in terms of n. This is an example of a planar domain, the domain in the sphere, or domain in the plane, with two limit n. Okay. It's also not hard to see that Brownian motion on this two-sphere would be recurrent, right? It's very hard to hit points. General theorem, like the formal structure, is that whenever I have two limit n, I'm always recurrent. I don't have to find a finite, finite genus or anything. So this, this kind of already tells you a little bit about in the future what happens. Okay, okay so my favorite, one of my favorite local problems at least is trying to understand all genus zero examples. So you'll see topological instructions in here. Um, so the genus, the kind of genus zero examples that we know of are the plane, the catenoid, the helicoid, and the Riemann example. These are all genus zero examples. Um, it's the, the content, okay, now in a natural way, you can see that the, the, the Riemann example is like a one, there's one parameter family of them. It's like an interval. And, and so if you go to one end, you see catenoids, so it's looking like catenoids, and at the other end, so it's looking like helicoids. And, uh, right. So I just want to talk a little bit about the topological instructions. If these are the only genus zero examples, note that we have topological instructions. There's no example of genus zero with three ends, four ends, five ends, six ends, seven ends. Okay, so by topology, these are the only examples. That's up there. Okay, there's only examples of genus uh, of genus zero and, and finite topology. Uh, so like I say, we have topological instructions there. Notice. We don't have any examples with three limit n. No any examples with one limit n. Okay? So there's another very general result, topological obstruction, that says you can never have more than two limit n. So I'll mention that and maybe say something about the proof. But we do have topological obstructions so already, this is a classification theorem, we have topological obstructions. Note in particular, no one limit n. You can generally have one limit in for infinite genus, but not one limit in for finite genus. And I've been trying to write, write part of that proof out. It's a complicated process. But, but anyway, there are top other structures that are related to this population. Okay. So how do we compute minimal surfaces? Uh, hopefully, most people have heard of this before, but they probably don't know what it, really what it is. It, 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 you can recover, uh, you remember the coordinate functions are harmonic functions. They're like the real parts of, like locally, of holomorphic functions on a surface. So it's not too surprising. No, well, maybe it's surprising. It's, it's a little surprising, I guess, uh, that, that you can actually write down the coordinates of a minimal surface in terms of its Gauss map, which is a meromorphic function, and essentially a one-form, uh, sort of a, yeah, a, a, a holomorphic one-form of the surface. So there's this format called the wire stretch representation for computing minimal surfaces. In terms of a Merrimer function, which is Gauss map, and some other whole form. And then taking real parts. Which one, right. okay. So, w what is this wire stress representation for the helicoid? Well, we have to tell what Riemann surface we're talking about. We're talking about the complex plane. So, we're going to apply the, apply the wire stress representation. On the complex plane, we're going to take the Gauss map to be e to the z, and we're going to let a w that that, that form. Notice that when you multiply these two, they kind of cancel out in a nice way. You just get dz. So the, the third form in the wire stretch representation is fairly simple. It's just dz, the real part, I guess, is the x3, therefore, is the real part of z. Okay, so we get sort of a nice, nice picture from the wire stretch representation. And so the first theorem here, here says the helicoid and the plane are the only simply connected examples that are properly embedded. And uh, of course, to do this, we just have to see it after rotation. The surface is C, the Gauss map is E to the Z, and this form, this other interesting form, you want uh, the complexification of dx3 is dz. That's all we really need to do to know it's the helicoid. So we have to recover the wire stress representation of a topological assumption. Uh, I'm going to kind of skip the plane case. Flat, the plane. 
interesting as the Dilbert. Okay, so uh, let me say something about this. This is a rather fascinating idea about how compactness and singularities give you information about structure. And uh, so let me just kind of real brief, brief idea here. Uh, if you took the uh, planes at integer heights, for example, like Riemann's example, essentially looks like planes at integer heights. Now, if you start homothetically shrinking it, what does that look like? This looks like a denser set of, of planes, uh, integer heights now, but small spacing. And the natural way that the lim limit object would be a culmination of our three by horizontal planes. So a natural way would be sort of take uh, planes at integer heights and just sort of divide by one over n, just homothetically shrink them, the, 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 that set in space then we convert to foliation of uh, R3 by horizontal planes. The helicoid, is, is in lots of ways, looks like a family of planes. If, if you go away from the z-axis, it just looks like a, a very flat multigraph. It just kind of looks like planes stacked up at integer heights, or at two pi heights, and it's kind of like a of it. Basically, planes are sort of equal spacing heights. It's only when you go a big distance around, you see that it uh, wasn't actually a flat plane, and now one inch higher, it the revolution around the axis got a little bit higher. So, so when you have a the shrink the core, you also see to get the same thing. You get a foliation of R3 by horizontal planes, but obviously it doesn't converge very well on the z-axis. So you have non-smooth convergence. And uh, so there's a singular set of convergence. So that's going to play a role. So uh, let me just state a theorem here that this work we depends on. It's a result of Coleman and Cozy where they try to understand compactness theorems for minimal surfaces when you don't have area estimates. Like in our previous picture, you take the helicoid, come with that, shrink it, the area is going to infinity all over the place. And yet we had a nice limit. Where it didn't convert smoothly was with one curve which intersected each, each plane in one point. So that, this is sort of a, sort of a, a I guess it was the motivation for their result. The helicoid shrinking, you can see this sort of picture. And they wanted to claim that somehow that was what you always got. So uh, they take a sequence of minimal disks. It's a local question. You can talk about this for surfaces in a three manifold. So it's just little balls, intersects little balls and little disks. So you think it's just a, it's a local question has a nice application. So you have a sequence of, of disks, embedded minimal disks in the unit ball. And you suppose the curvature in the sequence blows up at the origin. They all go through the origin, and the curvature is blowing up. So obviously things aren't going to converge very smoothly. But the theorem says that, in fact, there's a nice limit that's a foliation of the ball by, by disks, by minimal disks. And the convergence is not smooth along a curve, which is Lipschitz curve, sort of makes a, relative to the, the foliation, it's sort of it's tangent. But backwards and finals so everywhere, it's going to make it a reasonable angle with the, with the, uh, with the leaves. Okay, so, um, so that's, the, that's this picture they have. And then, I'd say the, the singular set intersects each of the disks in one point. Okay, so uh, it turns out one really wants to get better information about the singular set. My main interest in getting more information about the singular set is it has nice applications to topological obstructions. It turns out, it turns out, at least I believe it turns out, that if one can prove that the geodesic, I think it's not just a simple kind of curve, but it's actually a geodesic, in R3, that means it's a straight line, that actually, I think, finishes the proof that a finite genus cannot have the one limit in. I will explain why, but it's important to understand the, 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 what the geometry of the single set is. A little bit better than their description. So let me just talk about this, and I mean, also think of this as an application of the uniqueness of the helicoid. But the helicoid depends on this holding and cozy lamination theorem, but it's actually a refinement. It kind of tells you not only you get this, this sort of Lipschitz curve, but around that Lipschitz curve, the curvature looks big when you blow it up, you should see something that looks like he looks like. So it's a refinement. It's this geometric, what does it look like when the, when the curvature blows up? It looks like a helicoid. That's really what the unique, uniqueness of the helicoid tells you. When you, when you semiconductor the thing, curvature blows up, what do I see? I see a helicoid form. There's some order. Better, better order, the bigger, bigger the curvature. What? Uh, it, it means the, uh, the, 
I went the, uh, the uh, you say, say parameterize the speed once, then I went the unit normal to the uh, So let me try to explain this is thinking an application of uniqueness of the Hill equation. So we want to prove that, in fact, we have to have the foliation of the list of the Minicosi, uh, Colby Minicosi result. We have this sort of sequence of this, and they converge to a foliation of the, uh, after treating a subsequence, converge to a foliation of the ball. And we have a singular curve, which is our red curve. And what's this blue curve? <laughs> this blue curve is, uh, and we have points of big curvature, but we don't converge to it. So take a point of big curvature, another point of big curvature, kind of. They're converging to this red curve at some point. So we kind of imagine picking a geodesic that joins those two points. Okay. And uh, this Colby Minicosi picture says that somehow this spinning around this singular curve. It's fire like the helicoid. A, a rough sense, it should look like a helicoid. So you can get from here to here real fast by going close to where the singular curve is. You don't want to go way out of this multi shaded graph, you want to kind of go closer in. So that's my geodesic joining two points of large curvature. And uh, so what's the proof uh, that in fact when it has this nice regularity with these singular, singular curves uh, is uh, first you can check that this geodesic converges to the singular set, the set, the point set. And on the other hand, the curvature is blowing up along the singular set. So when you homotopy expand those coordinates correctly the right, at the right places, one sees a helicoid forming. Well, I was on a helicoid, it's, it's, you can take a point really high in a helicoid, a point really low in the helicoid, the geodesic of the link joining those two points very quickly has to access the helicoid. It's, so if these points are really far away, near the origin, it's almost a straight line going vertically along the axis. Okay, so that's just, uh, but the, of course you have to do things the, the right way. So, so near by the points of the curvature and signal, this geodesic, one sees uh, a helicoid forming. And that helicoid, from the proof of the Colby Minicosi result, the, the corresponding disk that's going to appear is the uh, sort of the tangent space of the helicoid further out. So you're going to, just like in a helicoid, you've got horizontal planes, think that's the tangent space of the disk that you're going to get. So, so this so the geodesic is like a orthogonal to the corresponding plane at these points. And then there's a little bit of a delicate argument. You have to blow up on not a, you have to blow up at a certain rate of, and kind of compare the this tangent vector to the to this geodesic to uh, the unit normal vector field of foliation. And if you know that that angle goes to zero, okay, and you know that the minimal foliation is is uh, always uh, well, it's re actually reasonable and nice. There's some regularity of minimal foliation. Uh, for example, unit normal vector field of foliation is lift shift. And uh, so, so anyway, so you have you have the, the tangent vector of sigma is making a small angle with this Lipschitz vector field. And uh, the angle goes to zero, it's not hard to see that if the uh, the curve goes to an integral curve of the, the vector field. And but it also goes to the singular set. So the singular set is a uh, integral curve. I tried real hard, actually yesterday I tried it again, trying to prove it's a geodesic, but it's, it's still, still not succeeding. <laughs> but anyway, I'd like to prove that the single curve is actually a geodesic. Okay, so, let me just say something about the proof. I, I did talk about this in Boston uh, recently, but I'm, I'm not going to say too much about it because I want to touch on some other subjects I didn't get to talk about the last time. Okay, so uh, just, just a brief idea. Step one, uh, maybe I'm afraid to write conjecture. Suppose you have a minimal lamination of R3. That's like a minimal foliation where you remove some stuff. Close set of minimal leaves. And uh, the claim is the only ones we know are where we take a closed set of parallel planes. That's the only foliations that we know, or only minimal laminations we know. This first general structure theorem is almost proves that, but it isn't, it's not sure it's actually proving it. It, it. it gives you lots of structure, and I'm not going to say too much about it, but it gives you lots of structure about minimal lamination. It doesn't prove what you want to prove, but it's a, it's a very nice kind of general, general result, <coughs> which turns out to be useful in this, in this proof of the uniqueness of the helicoid. Um, so uh, then a step two is to show that the 
uh, well, I'm going to remind you, the helicoid, if you look at the helicoid, it, if you go out horizontally, it's very flat. On the other hand, the, uh, it's never tangent. The tangent space is never horizontal. So it limits to be horizontal if you go to infinity, but it's never actually horizontal. That means the gradient of x3 is never zero. So uh, this is uh, step two you can think of as an uh, application of the uh, Coley Minicozzi result. One uses that to show that the, uh, the gradient here is never zero. So it's a period of a foliation. It's a little bit of Morse theory, critical points, uh, kind of comparing things. Uh, uh, the, the part of the more subtle, most subtle step is trying to understand what are called asymptotic curves of the gradient. Those are uh, integral curves of the, of the flow of the gradient vector field, which which don't go up to plus infinity. They kind of head out some finite height. So notice on the helicoid there are no such curves. So one needs to prove, in order to understand the conformal structure, one needs to have prove that, that there are no asymptotic curves. So it makes it look more like the helicoid. Once one has a, there's a little bit of a little lemma, which shows that if one takes once you get that's not zero, a little bit of lemma and another result I'm going to talk about later um, shows that we can actually take x3 plus I, x3 star, that maps you homomorphically into a complex plane, that's actually a conformal diffeomorphism. So that gives us a conformal structure. Right. And then step four is, uh, again, goes back to this sort of cold and cozy picture. And uh, we know the gradient of x3 is never zero. That means the tans that means the normal is never vertical. Right? That means that the Gauss map misses the north and south pole in the two sphere. Okay? That means that two spheres minus north and south pole is C star. The universal coverage space of C star is C. So if, if you can think of it, if, where the where the projection, the covering map would be E. So you can see the Gauss map is E to the f of C, where f of C is a homomorphic function on C. And then there's some analysis, like I say, you go back and look at the sort of polyminicose picture. One can sort of first get some information about f of c, that it's a polynomial. And then by that same method, one in fact sees by a, a tricky formula to calculate what the Gaussian curvature is, uh, that in fact that column is with degree of one. Okay. So you see a, pol a polynomial here, and then you see by the technique and sort of analyzing what the Gaussian curvature is about of a limit, that in fact that polynomial is and then we have, then, then we're really, we have to get a point. So that's the, the, the proof. Consequence is probably more interesting for most of the people here. Um, this is actually, the, the proof is quite quite general, and what it tells you is the asymptotic behavior of all proper minimal annuli in tree space. The thing is, the end of a surface, a compact boundary, you're mapping an annulus properly in minimally R3, what does it do? How does it behave? Well, it's either asymptotic to a plane, asymptotic to a category, or asymptotic to a field. The end of a field. Okay. And a little bit of thought about those particular things that asymptotic to, in fact, shows that the uh, if you take a properly embedded minimal surface with finite topology, so it's got annular end, then the, if we went, went to define it analytic in terms of wire stress representation, you can actually do it in terms of mirror morphology. So the surface is going to be conformally a finitely punctured Riemann surface, and the, the wire stress representation can be can be described in terms of mirror morphic data on that contact Riemann surface. So we're in the realm of algebraic geometry. Not surprising, one maybe could classify all possible all minimal surfaces as a finite topology. I mean, that would be a major. Uh, it's an interesting example to do. Uh, look at this. Uh, example would be a torus with one point. This is an example from Herman Karsha, Way, and David Hoffman, and he's going to talk about it. This is an example. This is a once punctured torus. And it's at the vector of the application. Let me let me show you how we get now get topological instructions from that previous theorem I just described. Uh, this is a, these are some um, older results before we knew a lot about minimal surfaces. So when the subject started, when I got in the, the subject, people were interested in examples of called finite total curvature. There are very controlled minimal surfaces. Examples people could easily write down. Okay. 
And uh, so what do we know now? We know that if you have finite topology, and at least two ends, we have finite total curvature. So I think that is a consequence of a better understanding of the general problem. So now general means finite total curvature, at least in lots of cases. General, now we're in this very restricted, very restricted situation of, of uh, finite total curvature. This is finite total Gaussian curvature. So, so okay, this is, like I said, these are older results that we didn't have so much information. So the first result is it has genus zero and has, uh, say, like I said, two ends. That's a planar cadmoid. And if it has uh, two ends in plane topology, then in fact it's a cadmoid. This handles, for example, towards minus two points. Can't do it. Okay. So let me describe these proofs. They're, they're really kind of clever little proofs. Let me say real briefly how one does how one does these proofs. Uh, the, the, the idea behind this certainly not very hard. Uh, this is the Lopez Ross uh, deformation argument. Uh, when you when, if you have genus zero, one of the properties is the homology, homology of the surface generated by the ends. Okay. Homology is where you calculate periods. One tries to Look at Wall's fineness of, of, certain, of data coming from the wire size representation. And in particular, since the ends are absolutely like planes and cadenoids, it's not hard to see that the what's called the vertical the flex is all vertical. So if you integrate the co norm around any end, it's actually a vertical vector. So that's what happens on a cadenoid. So uh, when one has that, one can do this change of the wire size representation and still get a well defined surface. If you take one of these examples, start doing this deformation, say with three ends, try to show the for this thing, one, two, this example, you could draw a picture, it's supposed to be like three ends, and you start deforming it, you, it's well defined, you can deform it. I uh, consider, well, could this surface, well, it starts out certainly perturbed a little bit, probably going to be embedded, but maybe eventually you can say, well, maybe they could kind of touch itself at infinity. The answer is it can't somehow, there's a maximum principle infinity, can't touch itself, it's always embedded, so that it's an openness property. Uh, limits of embedded things are embedded, so it's a closed property. You can take the parameter all the way to infinity. But then you look at the asymptotics near a place where the, where the, vector, where the tangent space is, where the, where the normal is vertical, or point, and one just sees the asymptotics as one gets the Enneper surface, or some version of Enneper surface. I order Enneper surface, never embedded. The arms are not embedded. So then you contradict that the family is always embedded. So uh, uh, I should probably say that the, uh, George and I had had, 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 right at the beginning of the subject, we, we, we showed that three, four, and five ends are not possible. So this is a much more general, better proof. Okay. Uh, Rick Shane's proof uh, uses Alexander's reflection principle. One understands that the top and bottom ends are asymptotic to catenoids. One kind of writes that down. And one applies uh, sort of Alexander's reflection horizontal plane, so it gets the symmetry in the middle. And then one I mean, so, so these cadenoids are all kind of lined up really nicely, same axis. And then you take you take uh, vertical planes, reflect coming in from infinity, and one proves it has lots of vertical plane symmetry, so then it's a surface of revolution and it's a One proves lots of symmetry and therefore not higher genus, it's not a surface of revolution. Okay, so that's the idea behind that. Okay, so let me tell you about one of my recent some recent problem I was working on, uh, that problem which I continue working on. Uh, when you have a minimal surface in R3, lots of examples, for example, Schurz's uh, example, which is like desingularizing two planes, have quadratic area growth. Uh, I mean, the area of walls grow like constant times uh, R squared. Um, so take such an example, then it turns out if you do the blowdown of the surface or chromatically shrink it, a subsequence will always converge to a cone. And uh, a cone over some set, I mean, like, like lines almost everywhere, like a cone in that sense. So um, the, this conjecture is the uniqueness of that cone. So if you take a different subsequence, or whenever you do the home with that, I get, always get the same cone. So I don't get a rotation version of the cone under some sequence of home with that is a different one than other times. So. So this is the uniqueness of that. So that, what this means is, as you go to infinity, the surface starts approximating the cone very quickly. And uh, that's going to be that's going to be important when I when I understand problem number this other conjecture. I'm especially interested in this when I have the area growth of two planes. Remember, I want to try to understand how you do singularize two minimal surfaces intersecting. 
try to do this, the area growth is like too, too plain. So, um, all right, so, so anyway, so when k is 2 pi, the claim is, this is the problem I'm really interested in, and you can do that into this, but uh, anyway, the, um, the, the claim is that t to the catenoids are true. Those are the examples we know, and the claim is that those are the only examples. There's the cat waves when you get a plane with multiplicity 2. Shirk is when you get two different planes. I think if planes intersect in the parallel. Okay, so, so I'm going to give you a partial result on that last conjecture. And that's under the additional assumption that the surface has infinite symmetry. People who are familiar with this subject, that's what generally what it, what one sees. One proves a theorem like the unique of the helicoid or uniqueness of the Riemann with infinite symmetry, and then later on you have to work a lot harder to try to get rid of the, the extra symmetry in the hypothesis, but you get insight in the problem. Uh, so the, the claim is that if you assume infinite symmetry, like Shirk or with catenoids, then in fact those are the only possible examples with area growth to, to pi, r squared. Okay, so what's the idea? Well, the first step is actually pretty easy. It's easy to do this unique limit tangent cone. And if the tangent cone has multiplicity 2, that forces the surface to be a surface of revolution under the symmetry assumption, so it's a catenoid. So, so that's, that's actually pretty, pretty easy. Uh, step 2 is now you want to use this uh, uniqueness of the limit tangent cone. So this, this, this part, I claim, is, can be generalized to the not, not, not infinite symmetry group property once you know you have a unique limit tangent cone. Anyway, um, so we. We have sort of these uh, two planes. The, the, the limit tangent cone in this case would be like two planes. Uh, and uh, you can apply the Alexander reflection principle by taking parallel planes. Now, what I want to do to this, this, this and you know, this problem, I can do it in the quotient space. We have infinite symmetry, so the symmetry in this case is actually make a vertical translation. So I can sort of consider this whole problem now in a quotient space, which would be S1 cross R2. So you can apply it in that case, uh, apply the Alexander reflection principle when you get two planes of reflective symmetry, just like short sh sh paths, right? Two vertical planes of symmetry. And those planes of symmetry actually divide the surface into two graphs over domains in the plane. So that's another part of that. Um, so when it gets actually, uh, Alexander reflection actually gives a better picture of what the limit tangent kind is, faster convergence. And, uh, then, of course, you can measure the angle. I'm thinking again, looking at the quotient space. So I'm looking at a surface of genus G with four annular ends in the quotient space. And one has the angle function between these planes, if you want, angle function theta, defined on a moduli space of all possible examples. OK, so uh, one studies what are called curvature estimates that allows you to prove that this map is proper in a natural sense. and um, one also proves an openness property. This uses very strongly the Alexandrov reflection property. One can divide the surface into pieces. One can study conformal structure and study the Teichmuller space for these pieces and see how things vary as you, you know, in, anyway, how things vary in the moduli space. And one, one sees immediately that the components of the space are curves. And each of these curves map onto the entire interval. And then there's a sort of nice, uh, Okay, na 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 natural, well, and a lot of these theorems, one wants to go to the boundary of mod moduli space. One actually wants to make singularities to understand the problem better. Kind of like the helicoid. One wants singularities. Singularities help you get asymptotics. So when the angle goes to zero, on, if you look, I don't know if you're familiar with what happens on the shark example. Let angle go to zero, where do you converge to? Well, you converge to a catenoid. I don't know if you realize that, but anyway, you converge to a cat. So you can, you can make that kind of analysis. And, uh, and especially in this problem, you can. And uh, that gives you, uh, with a substantial amount of Riemann surface, or algebraic geometry and Riemann surface theory, one can analyze how the, how the surface degenerates and how the wire stress data degenerates, essentially prove by implicit function theorem sort of the limit that the only examples when the epsilon is sufficiently small, when the angle is sufficiently small, it looks sufficiently like a catenoid where it's interesting that, in fact, the shirk. Very, very beautiful, uh, pretty analysis of algebraic geometry. Okay. Let me tell uh, earlier result. Remember, I also said that, sh that uh, the uh, 
<laughs> doubly periodic example is uh, unique. Uh, similar flavor to the proof. Uh, so let me just say a little bit about this. Okay, so we have a minimal surface in T2 plus R, and we assume it's genus zero. How do we see that it's sure? Okay, so, um, the first thing is genus zero could have infinite topology. One first step is to show you can only have a finite number of bands. Any M and P2 cross R can only have a finite number of bands. And actually that proof uh, shows in the case of genus zero, so that in fact it has like linear area growth. So that turns out to show the finite number of bands. And in the case of genus zero, well, so generally we don't have linear area growth, but, but uh, anyway, that out, but anyway, you have a finite number of bands and a linear area growth that take a Plate surface, non-positive curvature, that's a minimal surface in T2 cross R, that's non-positive Gaussian curvature. If you know it has linear area growth, then the Gaussian name formula shows that it has total curvature 2 pi times the order curvature. So it's finite total curvature. Uh, the Gauss map is still defined. You can do a lot of analysis. And uh, anyway, after doing that analysis, you can prove that you have a uh, finite number of annular ends. And they're actually, the top ends, like in Shirk, you have top ends going up, and you can have some bottom annuli going down in the space, and those are vertical. And they make different angles. Essentially because the homology is generated by the, by the ends again, so they make different angles. So you get this sort of basic picture of what it would have to look like away from a compact set. All right, so um, earlier Way had kind of analyzed this. This 2N and 2M means 2N top end, 2M bottom end. We have some number of top ends, some number of bottom ends. Look at the moduli space of all examples. We can find total curvature. We've got some like a complex variety or kind of analytic variety in there. The way I actually proved it's a complex, this, this moduli space is a complex analytic subset of CN. And we were actually able to prove, by being more careful, that it's actually an algebraic subset of CN. And then we used that the algebraic structure to actually prove that the angle map, I mean, the, an the top ends are like this, and the bottom ends are like this, and the angle between these ends, and we proved that this mapping's open. That's fairly subtle. Uh, then we use curvature essence again to show the mapping's proper. Uh, it turns out when epsilon is small, you can just kind of analyze asymptotics of what happened when it's small, and one sees immediately you don't have two or two end top ends or two bottom ends. In that case, it's easier to analyze weight already showing that it had to be. So uh, that's again sort of similar to right? you get sort of step one, step two, and step three, and sort of permeates a lot of these sort of classification questions. The natural approach, one proves uniqueness somewhere, one proves openness of some map, one proves uh, closeness of the map, or properties of the map. So uh, I, 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 I really would like to maybe talk about this. This is like a whole talk. Let me just kind of say something about the last talk. I was talking about Shurik examples in P2 cross R. So I just want to kind of say, what can we say about a minimal surface in M cross R, where M is a compact Hermannian surface? And it turns out there's a very beautiful uh, series of, of results. They're very general. Um, and uh, so we have our sigma in M cross R. Uh, so one of the basic results that has a finite number of N. So you can't have a lot of N uh, on the surface. Um, the second one is if you assume bounded curvature, then you have linear area growth. Remember I mentioned that in a T2 cross R case. And if you knew linear area growth, then you would uh, you'd be able to calculate the total curvature for finite, things like that. So we have finite number of ends, so finite genus, for example, and finite topology. Um, so then we'd like, for example, to also classify where the stable examples are. And one can actually classify where the stable examples are. This is probably the most subtle uh, one can actually explicitly write down in a natural sense the kinds of stable examples one has. And then in case of finite topology, again one has a very nice result. One has bounded curvature, linear area growth, okay, we actually find a genus, one has linear area growth, and finite total curvature. So again, has, you have a few topological obstructions in there. Okay. Let me come back to uh, maybe an easier thing. This is a real nice kind of result. Sorry, everybody in the subject should learn that's interested in that normal surface. So uh, this is just real easy. This is nothing deep. It's 
wasn't really known before, but it's, it's very, very nice and easy. So I'm going to try to how do you study conformal structure of minimal surfaces in R3? Uh, one way to do that is to look at certain functions that appear on those surfaces. So if one looks at this particular function, <laughs> R is the uh, distance from the x-ray axis. And you just sort of write down this sort of this function. It turns out it has a, some ni very nice properties. Uh, if you restrict it to any uh, minimal surface, it's super harmonic. That's something about the way flexes go. Anyway, it, it, it's, it's useful for analyzing a number of different problems of minimal surfaces, in particular conformal structure. So, interesting to give you an example. Um, uh, right, and another important property of this function is that in a horizontal slab, it's proper. So if you have a minimal surface in R3 and you just intersect it with a horizontal slab, then I automatically have on it a proper superharmonic function, which is the description of this uh, surface. So, um, okay, so then we have this little lemma, which is the consequence of having a proper superharmonic function, is that, that the, if you take the intersection of the surface with a slab and it's properly immersed in space, then that surface, uh, is parabolic, has full harmonic measure. All these follow from the persistence of a proper superharmonic function. And, and there's a nice sort of application of this lemma, which is to understand how, if you, if you generalize from a slab to a half space, um, it's very easy to show that, uh, so that if you have this property of being uh, parabolic in a slab, or full harmonic measure in a slab, then you automatically have it in a half space. Uh, you can think of the third coordinate function as a, an exhaustion function by parabolic region. Whenever you have that on a, on a uh, manifold, the manifold is parabolic, get full point measure. And this is just a description of how to go through that curve. This is just a little very elementary. And easy. Yeah. I think I'll skip that. So I'm going to talk something about the topology of the surface. So. Anyway, this is an easy exercise. Okay, so. Uh, so I'm changing subject to uh, trying to understand how are minimal surfaces embedded in free space. It goes back to the question I said uh, Lane had shown that the minimal surfaces in the three sphere are standardly embedded. Minimal surfaces in the three sphere are planned topology. So this is a, a, a direct generalization out there. Minimal surfaces in planned topology in our three are also embedded. There's only one way to do it. That's what this term says. So uh, let's see what that way is. Here's the picture. Collection of planes, join them up by unadded little tubes, and put your all the interesting topology at the top in the standard way. That's, that's what the surface is. So that's the, the embedding of a circular point topology. Okay, so now we've got to try to understand infinite topology. Uh, one, a whole bunch of examples, most of the classical examples were actually doubly periodic and triply periodic. Most examples that people knew about, maybe even still know about. Are of this type, turns out they always have uh, infinite genus in one end. They're all homeomorphic, but it's more complicated because they have infinite genus. So I want to try to understand infinite genus of minimal surfaces in R3 with one end. That's just the next problem. To understand that, one needs to, probably, probably the easiest way to understand that is to understand a little bit about topology. Uh, what is a Heger's building? I think most people don't know what a Heger's building with, of a non compact free manifold is. Uh, so, uh, to, to understand that, you just have to know what a handle body is. I mean, it's non compact handle body. A handle body is just a regular neighborhood of a properly embedded line complex in three space. Glue two of those three, two of those together, you make a Heger explosion. So, suppose you have a. So, uh, so one of our first theorem is that Heger explosions of R3 are determined by their genus. That means up, up to homeomorphism or up to proper isotopy, and the isotopy to. The genus of the surface determines the embedding of the space. Uh, and, and the other result is that minimal surfaces of one end are Heger's building. From a complementary result. So one knows that if you take Shirk's, uh, Shirk's singlet periodic surface, and Shirk's, it also has one end infinite genus. But doubly periodic, we know it has one end infinite genus. There's a homeomorphism of space takes one to the other. Basically, take any two classical examples of homeomorphism in R3 take them the other one. Okay, so now I want to understand that this a little bit about the case where you have more than one end. Uh, if you have more than one end, it turns out you can put stable minimal surfaces with contact boundary in one of the columns. Okay? 
minimal surfaces of, which are stable, uh, financial curvature, their ends are planes and catenoids. Uh, there's a notion of, of horizontalness, of parallelness of the ends. And it turns out there, you can when you describe a sort of notion of a limit tangent plane to the, to the surface, it's sort of the tangent plane of these catenoids and planes in a complex sense. Anyway, it's so actually the each minimal surface is a notion of horizontal. So that's a, 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 a plane. So it's rotated so it's horizontal. That's what we usually do. Uh, okay. Yeah, so every M has a unique one of planes, such as for a first cell. Another nice sort of general result is that, and I'll describe that in a second, uh, the, once one has this sort of notion of horizontal, then one has an ordering on the ends. All the ends can be sort of ordered by their relative heights over this plane, sort of pick out. Okay. And the way you do that is this sort of picture, kind of, this is plane, you have cylinders, and basically, between any two ends, trying to drift off to infinity, one can sort of separate them by uh, capnoids and things. So I think uh, that's about it. Uh, anyway, I'll talk about those things another day. <laughs> two-parameter family you can write down in terms of the elliptic function. Um, so in particular, all the examples are going to be periodic. But, uh, right. And understanding that is very closely related to understanding, again, the quality of the singular set, the geodesic. And you can prove a lot of things in that case. You can prove the singular sets are geodesics. You can take limits. So you take a limit of these examples, you take go outside the, go the boundary model of those space. What do I see on S2 cross S2? S2 cross R, you don't see a diagonal geodesic on S2 cross R, or I see two vertical, like a point, vertical geodesics on S2 cross R, or they could actually come together, and that's the boundary of the moduli space. And, 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 and that, that, that's the boundary of the moduli space. On the other hand, it's also the boundary of the space of examples we know, it's a two-parameter family of examples. I don't quite know the, the, the geodesic going up. I have a Lipschitz curve going up that's pretty close to, anyways, the, the techniques are useful for understanding it. Never a problem in that context. Theorem with uh, Gulliver, stable, you couldn't do it. Um, 
there's an, also this related problem that, that uh, I would guess this time we're probably be able to remove properness assumptions about uh, minimal surfaces like the helicoid and the flame are only complete immersed one one immersions in our group. So that's sort of semi related to that question you're asking. Like, uh, so you're looking at properness. In general, I don't know. Yeah, There's still a big question about isolated singularities. Yeah, but but there's related questions which are related to the other things I talked about in my talk. I would like to get rid of the word proper. One one immersions complete are always proper. I think I probably could do that by point of topology. But uh, that's something I want to work on. That's related to that question. 